What we can do for other architectures, maybe other kernels, don't know yet, we'll have to see whether other people are interested in doing that, and scaling up from um, uh, the bread and butter of kernel testing and um, basic root of S testing on ARM um, development boards, scaling up and see what else we can do and what else can be done with this software. So the slides are in the uh, Git Annex for DevConf Share, the URL is on there, and there's a Gobby document as well which contains the main text of the slides, so feel free to add um, information and comments and topics on that as well. So Lava started off being um, deployed through a sort of PyPy arrangement. It's recently been packaged for Debian. That's been the main role I've been doing for the last, it's actually taken a year to get it up and ready. Um, and it's now actually in Debian for Jesse. So what is Lama actually doing? It's doing continuous integration testing. So we have um, CI jobs that submit kernel builds. Um, so the, stable, the, the Linaro stable kernel, Android builds. Then we have a number of instances. The main um, instance has uh, 103 devices online at the moment. And the, we have a staging instance which has another 40 of. And there's various developers who have a, a, their own setups uh, to try and expand the range of the devices available. Um, it's based currently around a lot of OS deployment testing. That's not just Debian based. We, a lot of the images uh, are still Ubuntu based. We do a lot of open embedded work. Uh, we recently started to get a lot more work from Yocto. We've asked and sought involvement from people doing Fedora testing, and so far we've only got a little bit of interest. Uh, we're not sure what the problem is with that. It's maybe just the, the Fedora approach to ARM or the, or the particular way the images get built. But if, there are, you know, if there's any interest in other operating systems outside that, we are more than willing to take it on. And the principal thing we've been doing so far is a lot of kernel boot testing. Um, has this particular kernel build improved over the last build? Um, so you, so you, you start off with a simple boot test, but then you start to actually track performance data. And you're doing LTP tests, and you're tracking the, the, the failure rate um, across multiple tests and multiple periods of time. We've I've recently added uh, multiple node. So multi-node allows you to have a single test that runs across multiple devices. Those devices can then be synchronized purely over the serial connection that all these devices share. Uh, they can raise the, their own network, they can do whatever they need to do with their own switches and their own uh, environments. And you can have um, multi-OS deployment as well. So you could have an OE box talking to a Debian box it's trivial. The main thing that we need to talk about with Lava, with a lot of people in a lot of conferences, is the idea that we don't write the tests, we don't define or, or prescribe what tests you can run. So people often ask, well, what tests can Lava run? Um, whatever you can think of. Um, the tests are written by the users who want the data. And the tests are then developed and upgraded and worked on by the people who want the data out of the tests. We have our own tests um, that try and stress Lava itself, but those are largely irrelevant to the people who actually want the data on the, on the systems, because quite often we are testing with a static kernel build and the static root of S, uh, and they're submitting jobs that are a new build every time. We do track results over a long period of time. So one of the main features is you can go back right the way through the database, track a particular series of builds, and watch how it actually performs. So if I go back to here, that's a simple graph for my local box. It doesn't go back that far in time. There are other ones on the main servers that go back a lot further. So you're just tracking the pass and fail of a particular series of tests. You can see the various things were going on there. At one point or other, my own installation being a development box 
wasn't performing as well as it should do for production, so the results dipped. Those summary reports are created by users. We don't, we put the, the facility there for people to write those reports, but the reports are written by the people who want the data. Um, so the data can be exported. That, what, that main report there is basically a simple overview um, as, and, and a front end to your data. But you can export the data for further analysis, combine them in new ways, and work out what actually happens with the rest of it. And the actual deployments you can do, what Lava can do, is can be expanded by, if you, by particular hardware. We've got ideas for, um, we call it the NMP, it's still in sort of final testing, but it allows you to, to put a, um, a relay between critical parts of the device and the device setup. So it allows us to switch the SD card um, externally as controlled by the test itself. So suddenly your SD card goes away. Uh, you can switch away the network. You can switch off the SATA. You can switch the SATA to a different connection. Um, we, that's not just useful in terms of being aggressive with the test and seeing how the kernel behaves, but it's also useful to allow us to test bootloaders. Because you can put a bootloader on one SD card, switch it over so that the device can see it, boot the device from that SD card. Oh, it's bricked. Switch the SD card back to the previous image and boot it again, and it's fine. So a lot of the automation comes down to um, being able to automatically recover boards. There will be situations, these are dev boards, there will be situations where it's managed to fry one of the controllers in the, on the board. There'll be various issues. Like we got uh, one particular board can lock the SD controller in a completely invisible and transparent and, and, and uh, undetectable way. We can we try and work out in advance, oh, okay, there are things you can possibly do to indicate that this particular board of that type is suffering this kind of problem. You try and put some diagnostics into the test in advance to see whether you're actually going to like it to hit that problem and compensate and work around the problems of particular boards. So what does Lava currently support? There's the ARM bias. Not surprising, for instance, where we're actually starting from. And Lenaro is concentrated on ARM v7. So we don't look at um, ARM v5, ARM v6 or older. Uh, ARM v7 are the main pieces of hardware. That, that's the majority of the lab. ARM v8 is then coming in with new hardware and emulations and models. Uh, but the majority of the boards that are available for testing currently are ARM v7. Uh, we've got support for where the boards themselves support it, running a virtual ARM system on the physical ARM hardware. And that allows you to actually test both sides. You can run tests on the physical hardware whilst it's running a VM. You can run tests inside the VM. And if you've got the right hooks, you can actually then communicate across and through the VM. Or you can actually communicate with another node uh, the, uh, that's set up to interrogate it in another way. There are x86 systems in the lab at the same time, not just for actual Lava deployment, but actually as test devices. There are situations where people need that, so those devices can be available. Um, via emulation, we can do any of the other architectures that Qemu supports. Um, we haven't got a lot of uh, any physical hardware in the Cambridge lab, but with Lava and Debian, you can easily install that and set it up uh, with your own architectures. Very useful feature is the idea of dummy devices, and these can be a simple S root, so an isolated root environment, or SSH. And that allows you to connect to a, um, a device that, is, that hasn't actually had to have a deployment. It's, it's, it's sitting there pre-configured, and it may be serving a lot of different jobs and you actually have jobs that connect into it and do certain things with it. Contention on that box is your problem as the test writer. That's not up to Lava to try and sort out. If you've got two jobs going in on SSH and both of them try to run dpackage, um, sorry, you have to sort that out yourself. Um, 
So a lot of the, of the bills coming through are CI bills for, um, for kernel bills. We still do a lot of Android testing. And then we, we are working towards increasing support for testing bootloaders. Uh, obviously, U-Boot was one that we started with, in, in, inevitably with ARMv7 uh, dev boards. UEFI is the next big change and the next big bootloader uh, we need to test. And then Grub is something else that we are looking to support. We don't really have explicit support for Grub uh, in Lava at the moment, but it's on the development line. As I said, we are currently only actually testing Linux kernels. Uh, there may well be hidden assumptions in how the, uh, the structure works um, for other kernels. We don't know yet. We'll have to find out when the community tells us. So the test jobs are written basically using shell and markup, YAML. You can address and execute any utility binary, anything you can actually build or download or put onto that system. Um, most of them, if you define the right parameters for the kernel, you can have a nice networking interface and you can pull down whatever you need. It's up to you, you set it up in the, in the test. So you, we get results based on whether the, de the deployment itself worked, then the test that you wrote, and then there's parsers to work out whether there's pass or fails, and you can do measurements, and you can do record the units of those measurements as well. Um, now, a lot of the time, you're running someone else's test suite, LTP or some kind of Python unit test type thing. You often have to write your own parsers. Sometimes you can do that in the YAML with a bit of Python regex code. Sometimes it's actually a lot easier to write a, uh, a custom script in whatever language you prefer, whatever language you can actually ensure is executable on that platform, and run the test inside that custom script. Then the custom script just outputs the test results in a format that is easier to understand. What Lava does is it gets hold of whatever the deployment's going to be, whether it's an image, a series of tarballs, and we overlay a basic set of data and shell scripts. Uh, there's a bit more data and shell scripts if you're actually doing it with multiple nodes, but generally you've got a common interface there that's based on, um, on POSIX shell compatibility. But we don't define what you can run, and we like to think that we are making no assumptions about what the device is capable of. Sometimes that lets us down, um, because there are ways where you sometimes have to make some kind of assumption of what the device is able to do. Um, and sometimes we do push back at the device manufacturers and say, now look, the way that you've actually asked us to test this board and the way it actually boots is not going to work. We need to have something that's a bit more sane and a bit more reliable, because we are automated after all. You can't have a, um, a board that needs a lot of manual intervention to get the thing to boot in the first place. We're, we're booting it three or four times per test a lot of the times, or even more. So the, it, we sometimes have to push back at the manufacturers and say, oh, look, give us a board that we can, um, we can reasonably automate. But other than that, and as I said, we, we work hard to make sure that there's an automated way of recovering from a bricked device, or what, other, what would otherwise be a bricked device, without any kind of intervention from the lab admins. They're busy enough as it is. So, now we're reaching out to Debian. Um, we've been using Ubuntu to actually run the infrastructure for a while. We've now got it all migrated over to Debian. All the packages are in Debian. We're running the packages as they are in Debian. We are looking to test the, the, test the ARM MP kernel. I've been working with a number of people in Debian already on exactly how to do that. So we're looking at Where's the overlap between the boot reports that we can access elsewhere, the available boards in Lava, and the DDBs that are defined in the ARMMP kernel? Got some links there for the, the, various, the various information. That's the summary of the boards we've found so far that can easily be um, tested for the ARMMP kernel. I've, I've put in a request for um, extended support for the ARM deal, because that should add another couple of devices to that list. 
What we're trying to achieve with the RMMP is make sure that not only does the RMMP kernel boot, but that hardware that is available on the board is actually operational under the RMMP kernel. We know that for some of those boards on that list, um, various components, various pieces of hardware are not operational after you've booted the RMMP kernel. So this gives us a way of producing um, repeated tests over a long period of time to try and track this and see whether we can improve it without causing regressions elsewhere. Uh, those are just the main devices that we've got at the moment. We're obviously open to having more devices added to the lab or to a different lab and having access. Some of those devices on there are not physically located in Cambridge, but we would still be able to use those within Debian. So the particular challenges with RMMP, we need to be able to put the modules into the init RAMFS. We can test with the init RD that um, the init RAMFS tools actually make, but that is then using KLibc. So we'd like to be able to use um, other init RAMFSs with the RMMP modules put in, and then you've got a glibc environment and you can do more, uh, more testing. We need to do, decide on which DTPs we can actually support in the RMMP kernel and put the data out there and let people work out what boards they can reliably use. At the moment, it's, it's a bit hit or miss as to whether the RMMP kernel supports your board. Let's get the data, let's get the test results and find out what's going on. We can submit these jobs over XML RPC to a variety of existing instances and do a variety of other tests on each one, including uh, testing the Debian installer on ARM. Um, there are ways of preceding that and making it work without um, uh, interaction, so we can test that through. That will generally mean that we need to start testing um, with dual media, so that we can actually have a, a booted media and a deployment media. Uh, so we're looking at some of the boards that support SATA for that. And this comes back to what we were talking about in the first talk, about what Lava can do in Debian in conjunction with PyU Parts and CIDebian.net and the archive rebuilds. So it, Lava is an opportunity for Debian to start testing outside the idea of just the one package. It allows you to start testing combinations of packages. It allows you to start testing uh, a distribution against a different distribution, whether that's a different suite or a completely different dist distribution. We can test Debian against open embedded. We can do a whole range of, um, of, of upgrade tests. We can actually work out whether this actually works in a multiple node environment. You have a client and a server, physically separate devices, upgrade one, does the, does the client still work? Uh, okay, we didn't expect that to necessarily work. Right, upgrade the client, does it recover? Um, you can do testing across multiple architectures and as, as I said earlier, about, um, across or through the virtualization barriers, depending on what kind of um, support you compile into the test. The images themselves or the deployments that we support, we can always make better tools for those. We can make use of existing tools. We can patch them and increase their, uh, their availability. And then these the upgrades so that we can actually work out, can you go from squeeze all the way up to SID with this particular set of packages? Can you throw some dirty data into there? Can you throw, can you throw some dirty images with, with uh, random configuration changes and does it still work? Because you can define all that. You haven't got to just say, oh, I just want a basic to bootstrap on e in each case. You can build the image you want, put in whatever di dirty contamination or configuration changes you want and throw the images into Lava and see what you get. Very useful tip um, <clears throat> when you're actually developing tests is hacking sessions. Basically, you install OpenSSH server. Lava has support for accepting your public key as a parameter and your IRC nickname. It'll boot 
the device you've chosen with the image you've specified, start up OpenSSH, and then notify you on, on IRC saying that the, um, the, the session is available at this URL uh, with a, in a private message, and you just put that into a terminal, connect, and you're in. So you're then in on the test image you've chosen on a device that you've selected of a particular type. And you're in a full Lava session. You've got all of the uh, Lava helpers and scripts and overlays there in front of you in, the, in your path and you can see what's going on. But that's only what we've thought of. That's what we've thought of, of within the Lava team as to what we can offer <coughs> Debian via the Lava structures. So it's a question of coming back to us when you've played a bit with Lava and see what you can do. Install it in one of your own boxes, see what it can do, see what it can connect up, and come back to us with what else it can actually do. Now, after we've done the work on the packaging, uh, Antonio will know all about this because we've, we've done all the planning for the refactoring. So this is intended to make it much, much easier to extend and develop inside Lava. So if you, you're looking at, right, Lava doesn't support this kind of device, how can I get it to support this, this particular mode, this particular feature? We're looking to make it a lot easier in the code base to actually work your way through that because Lava has developed org organically and now the refactoring is urgent. So we're looking at modular components, much more identifiable sections of where things go, making sure that actions are, are important, and diagnostics, making it much clearer, much more obvious, and much more common that when Lava spots an error, not only is Lava able to say, yes, that was, sorry, that was a Lava error, file a bug and we'll work on it. Um, that was an infrastructure error because a network switch has probably failed or something or someone switched it off. Um, or that was a job error, you've made a typo in one of the scripts. Or it was actually genuinely a test failure. So working through those kinds of situations and then when we've got Lava errors or um, device errors, something gone unexpectedly wrong, but what can we do? Whilst we've still got the connection to the device in that particular mode, can we actually get just some reports of data, get it into the logs, get it into the actual test results and say, well, there's, it, there's what we try to work out. If even, even if it's just what's, I, what's IF config saying, what's root dash n saying, what's nmap saying? Um, just get the data out there so that people have a chance of working out what the state was at the time. We don't do enough of that yet. The, the refactoring will also concentrate on allowing you to simulate the job in advance. So you'll be able to run through your test definition and see all of the actions, all of the parameters, all of the actions and the commands that that thing would actually do on the actual device. You can follow it through step by step then we get more of the data coming back. At the moment, we have the logs, and then we have the result set, the result bundle. We don't actually have enough data coming back into the results, so that's what we're gonna fix with that. And allowing people to override. The, one of the common problems is that as Lava developed, there were a lot of devices that had quite slow reactions to some of the operations. So some of the timeouts got longer and longer and longer and longer. Um, some, of the, um, some of the snowballs, some of the V-Expresses, they took such a long time to get through all the different firmwares and all the different stages in boot that they, the, the timeout for a failed boot got long, too long. Um, and it became a, de a default rather than actually being customized to particular boards. So we're gonna fix that and make sure that for devices now that boot much more quickly, if it fails to boot, you're not sitting there for five minutes after it's failed to boot to get the message for Lava to time it and think, actually, actually that didn't boot. Right, sit at the back there, quietly working on the video, is Andy, who's working on the idea of putting Lava into hardware. 
So it's an open hardware design that will be based on Debian Jesse, and the idea with this is to allow you to have Lava in your bag at a demo, at a conference, already set up. I support up to six devices on one little box, single five, um, five volt input, and you'll be able to just connect up the devices. You'll have a PDU inside the box that will be um, um, controllable remotely. You'll have a network switch inside the box. You'll have serial connections. And the serial server, again, remotely accessible, remotely controllable. And you can turn the, the serial, serial off completely during a hard reset. We, there are devices. There was one there, the QB2, which came up earlier, uh, where there's a design flaw in the hardware. And if you leave the serial connected when the device is hard reset, it locks the bootloader in a bad state, and you can't actually get back into the test image. So that was one of the boards that led us to this situation where we think we have to actually have an easier way of getting our developers set up with a lab on the desk, and then working through and thinking, actually, that's going to be really useful for conferences and every developer working on Lava or just wanted to test stuff. You can actually put these up as a, as a full rack, as a full lab, or you can have them as a dedicated unit with a little board inside, a nice little SATA drive, and you've got a whole lab in one unit. Now, let's just show you, if I come back over here. Currently, this is what Lava actually looks like. So you can see it's using a local file. This test took, uh, actually took about 47 seconds. So it uses a local image. That was built with VMD Bootstrap, which is a nice little tool that uh, Lars uh, originally brought in which Antonio and I have uh, improved after that. You get a nice checksum to make sure that what we've downloaded is what you think we've downloaded. There's the overlay. We come through and then right past that, do the overlay, pass it down to Coemium in this case because this is a KVM test. No boot output, no, no, no. lots of output, all tracked. There's your uh, network address and network information. Here's a kernel boot time, five seconds. That's automatically tracked, and that, uh, the stuff like that will be tracked uh, across the board. You can see here Lava KVM01, so that's where the overlay stuff actually lives. Nice little check to make sure that there's actually some available space inside the KVM before you start doing stuff. And then the test runner. Doing stuff like right, dump the IF config and output. There it is. That passed. And then get some routing information. Do a test ping. Make sure the actual Ethernet is sane and working. See if you can install the package. And it passed. And come down to the end, and you've got a result bundle. The result bundle is just a way of collecting all the different results you get from the Lava tests and your own tests. So you can see here the Lava test results. We deployed, we ran a test shell, we gathered the results, and the, uh, the job came back as complete. And then the user tests work out something like that. So the ping test actually failed at that point. That's mainly because my laptop is not bridged, um, because, just because. <laughs> um, so when the KVM came up, it didn't have a, um, uh, it came up behind a natted address. So this is on staging, which is our test instance. A lot more devices, a lot more jobs running. So if we look at Well, just looking through that, are there any 
Uh, let's, let's do one of these foundation models. Let's see what that looks like when we go through. So again, we work up through, we... Foundation model, you're probably better off explaining this than I am, but it, <laughs> it's modeling an ARMv8. Um, right in saying it's not actually an emulation, is it? It's, it, models, it models the entire CPU. This one is running on x86 and modeling uh, an ARMv8. Right, so that one. Oh, yeah. So you, you get various aberrations then when you're expecting various facilities to work because you're expecting this real hardware and they're not there. So you, you can record that and you can work on what's going on. Now we're back into a normal test. So the point of showing that is that despite the disparity in the actual hardware there, you get a very common, very similar interface. If you go back to a real piece of hardware, let's go for a Panda. That's what the that's what the submission actually looks like. We're currently using JSON. We are looking at um, using YAML for future deployments once the refactoring is in place. But you can see there that's where the image is obtained from. You can see where parameters are inserted into the, um, the YAML file that is actually in the test definition in the repository. And there's where you submit results and you're saying, right, that's a Panda device type and it's given a, a job name and a, and a default timeout, which I, each action will use as their timeout unless it has a specific action uh, timeout, just like the lava test shell. So if you look at the complete log, This time we have to try and connect to a real device. It's not a KVM or an emulation on a model. We've got a real bit of hardware. So this is where the serial um, server comes in. We actually, so this is the, this is um, Cyclades uh, for serial four. And it gives us a Telnet interface. Our nice familiar U-boot. Drives us all nuts. The Panda is using a partitioned SD card, so we boot into what Lava calls currently the master image. This is one of the ways that we currently make sure that the test image doesn't uh, make our Panda unusable for the next test in the line. So this one isn't uh, testing bootloaders as such uh, at the moment because it's relying on the uh, the same bootloader, but you're just allowing a test image to be deployed onto the third and fifth partitions on that SD card. So we check that the master image coming up is sane in case something has managed to break it in the previous test. And then we get hold of the test image. So the panda's doing a lot of this work. We then send the modified tarballs with our overlay back to the Panda, write it out onto the SD card, sort out the boot partition, check that we've still got this, a sane um, system, and then we go down for a reboot. So this is now expecting to come back up into the test image. At this point, we've, we are able to control U-boot. Lava uses uh, pexpect a lot, so we are in, um, interrogating the, the serial output at each point. And Lava is stopping U-boot and saying, well, I'm gonna set this command. Now I'm gonna set that command. And that's how, when you reboot into the test image, Lava is able to make sure that you go into partition three because it's telling it, you load the, the test U image from partition three, not partition one, where it would have come from to get into the master image. 
So there's your boot of the test image. And the other partitions with this own little rootfs, and now you're in the narrow test. So you're inside a test image. Similar sort of stuff. You work through, and you've got the same interface again with your test runner inside the image you've defined. You're passing in information about which ones, about the, uh, which tests are passing and failing. And I mean, well, this is quite a long test. It's one of our functional tests, but it's a bit longer than some of the others. So you can see this test image was a Ubuntu rearing image. So this, this is one of the ones actually that will um, cause trouble if I choose to resubmit it because Ubuntu have now taken rearing off their mirrors and you can't see rearing. Um, so these kinds of things uh, are things that you need to think about as a test writer. Well, what, what am I basing this on? And then in the years to come, we've come back, well, actually, I want to rerun that test back from there. If you're relying on third party sources for the updates and the other bits you're bringing in, if you want to run these things long, uh, far ahead in the future, put the stuff in your own repository, take a snapshot of it, keep it, so you can run that test in, in, in the future. This test suffers from that problem that it's an old test and I wouldn't be able to get hold of that data. There we go, failed to fetch. Doesn't exist anymore, 404. But Lava carries on because there's not a problem, it's just one of, the, one of the tests didn't run. So it goes on, tries to work out what other tests it can run and reboots into the master image. Once in the master image, yep, again checks that it's half sane, gathers up the result data from the test image because the test image is on, is on the same SD card so the master image can easily just read the data around and then passes it back to the server. You can see there Direct update failed, direct install failed, curl FTP failed, um, simply because the, source, the, the information wasn't there. That's an indication of how you do use the, the measurements and, and units. Just a little demonstration of, of that in this particular test. And the result bundle is there. Because we had um, multiple test definitions inside one test, you've got multiple sets of results. You can do it so that you have an automatic reboot between each of these sets of tests, or you can combine them and have all your tests running uh, in, in sequence, in the sequence you've defined in your own test. They're not resorted or anything like that. You define everything about how the test actually runs. Now. Quickly look up Okay, so if we go to here This is what a test definition actually looks like Currently we're working on well, this part isn't likely to change, actually, with the refactoring. The submission format may well change, but the structure here is not likely to change much. You're defining a little bit of metadata, maybe. Uh, it's not necessarily deterministic. We don't re rely on the fact that you've marked the OS Ubuntu. It's just a clue for the result parsing. Um, same with the devices, That's, that device list is there mainly to help other test writers work out whether you've already thought of, support, of this test supporting their devices. It doesn't actually preclude someone trying it on another device. And you start with the basic set of run steps.
That's a very simple. Mm -hmm. Go up a little bit further. This one has install dependencies. So you can start with someone's image and then think, right, now I actually need to add stuff. Um, if it is a uh, Ubuntu or Debian based uh, test image, then it's simple to actually install them as packages and just say, well, I know that uh, Fred's test image over there didn't have these things installed, I'm going to add them in for this particular test. And then you just go through on each one and do a little, more, do a little bit more testing. So you can see you know, we, we're calling there um, a check IP SH script, which is part of the Git repository that this YAML file lives in, because the test definition is cloned directly into your test image, and you can run anything that is in your Git repo. That's where, uh, that's where you do all your scripting and do all your definition of things that don't quite fit into a single line of YAML. If, it's, if you start needing to use a lot of pipes and redirects and maybe a bit of regex parsing, that goes into a, a script of whatever language you want to write it in yourself, <laughs> whatever your preferred language is, or whatever the test image can support. You can compile it from C if you want. As long as, you, as long as the test image has a compiler, of course. Some of them don't. Okay. Oh. Just before, just before Daniel, let me show you the... <laughs> right. We've written quite a bit of documentation. It is all available. Every time you install Lava, you get all this, inf all this documentation <coughs> on each of the instances, and it is, the, it is the documentation for that version that you've currently installed. Naturally, a lot of that documentation has been written by the developers, so it's, it may well be something that you need to actually um, you know, come back to us and help us improve. Patch is welcome. <laughs> well, I wrote a lot of this, lot of this documentation. I, I definitely know it needs patching. Right. So that's the, the link there for the, uh, the, the main documentation on the main lab server. The staging instance is there. If you've got questions after the talk, come to us on the mailing list or on the Hashlin or Lava of TCC channel, and there's our Git repos. And you can, you can come to us directly on bugslinara.org with an account, or you can just use the Debian BTS, and you, that's the, the install command to go and have your packages. Daniel. So actually, uh, is this working? Yep. Uh, so the first question I had, I think you actually answered, which was, um, whether there was a way to program how to acquire the serial connection. Um, because you kept saying, it's a serial connection, it's a serial connection, and then at one point you mentioned a cyclades service. Right. That comes under the device type configuration. So Lava will work out, or will assume, that pandas have a particular way of being connected. Um, and you, you pass that connection command on a per device basis. So you say that panda 6 is on cyclades 4, port 17. Um, and is that generic enough to, for example, do IPMI connections and that kind of thing? Yes, there's a, there's a whole range of, of different ones that people are using. Uh, it is just a connection command. So it, it is the, it's the entire command, including the, um, whether you use Telnet or whether you use um, Screen or Minicom or whatever you actually need to use to actually get onto that board. So my second question is, uh, you mentioned the hacking mode, and that sounds like a really, really useful thing to have. Does that work on systems that don't have networks? I'm not sure how you could actually get a hacking session. Serial connection? The serial connection, the problem with the serial connection is that Lava has a, um, a requirement that we have access or that we have control of the serial connection because we're mm -hmm. running PXPECs on it all the time. So if the, with the refactoring, there will certainly be ways of having secondary connections onto boards. Uh, which could allow, a, if the board supports a second serial or something like that, or some kind of other way of doing it. Um, I should not re-export the serial connection. 
to a PTY and then let an incoming SSH session to the server. Talk to it. Um, It'd be really useful. Patches. Ha ha ha. Impressive. <laughs> Okay, uh, third question. The Lava overlays, yeah. are they static or are they per test run? There is data that is test run dependent. So what do you do if you can't repack the image? Take, say, for example, that what you're trying to deploy to a system is a signed lump. Yeah, we'd have to look at that in terms of um, the, that is going to be one of the things we need to look at with the refactoring. Currently, we don't actually have a way of, of, of doing that. If we receive um, an image, we will currently break it up into bits and deploy it onto different partitions. Um, but there is certainly going to be a need for how we actually do it. One of, the, one, of the, I, one of the plans will be that we will deploy it as signed. We will use whatever we can um, instruction-wise to verify that it was signed. Then we'll just blattle over it. <laughs> 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 You're almost making me forget my last question. <laughs> no, you have made me forget it. <laughs> Does anyone else want this? Otherwise, I'll remember it in about another 30 seconds. Oh, yeah. Uh, the tests that you showed that indicated that you could say, oh, I require OpenSSH server, or I require NTP. Yep. Are they declarative enough that for systems which you can't install packages on, like, say, an Android system or an otherwise arbitrarily static system, you can say, ah, I can run these tests because the system is exporting these tags in some manner? No, that would be down to the test writer. Um, right. So, for example, we get this problem with Open Embedded. Um, Open Embedded is a problem in that, unlike any other distro that's out there, it does not identify itself. There's no tag, there's no, nothing in an open embedded image that says, hi, I'm open embedded. So you have to look for everybody else and get to the end and think, right, it must be open embedded because there's no, nobody else to be recognized. <laughs> um, not even an LSB release? <laughs> no, not necessarily. It only has LSB release if you compile as LSB release into your open embedded image. <laughs> it's, it's too much control. Um, so, yeah, yeah. The, we can't necessarily uh, be real, um, accurate enough in working out exactly what system you've got on there um, to, work, to work out, yes, you've got that uh, available, available or whatever. And it's not really Lava's job. It's a case of, well, you gave us the test image, you gave us the test definition. Um, catch. <laughs> yeah, if, I have... If you, test images, if you break it, you, 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 you get to keep both bits. And I want you to marry these <laughs> test images to these images. Well, we, we will, we will, Lava will do that and marry them together. But if it breaks, it breaks. Right. Um, and a final thought on the packaging thing. If Lava were to provide a way to specify pseudo package names, yep. and I don't mean in the Debian pseudo package sense, uh, then you might find that's going to make the Fedora people slightly less unlikely to not come on board. Because okay. at the moment you're saying this depends on these Debian package names, effectively. Well, the test definition the bite, yes. Um, but if you can have more test definitions that are generic across distributions, then yeah. you, might, you might get somewhere more. But then, it, but then it's easy for uh, someone to come across with a, um, a, a Lava installer script that is based on YUM. You know, we, it's it's there. It is it is extendable. It's, this is this isn't hard code somewhere in the depths of the Python code of Lava. It's there in a shell script that's copied onto the board. Um, so the, the the Debian and Ubuntu images have a little shell script that is Lava install packages, which calls apt get. Antonio, did you have a question? So how does the binaries work? Is that uh you have both, besides having drivers for each type of device, you also have something similar for uh, types of test images. So you have uh, Debian, Fedora, Open Embedded. So when, you, when your test definitions say uh, it depends on full, it will install full in the right way 
in Debian or Fedora. And then for open embedded where you can't actually install stuff, then your test your test images needs to have that stuff already installed. And then or the, compile it. The, yeah, the, the, the dependency installation step will just say uh, give a warning, say, oh, he, uh, you depend on these packages, but I don't know how to install. I'm assuming your image already has them. Yeah. And then in the, ca in, the, in the case where you have like packages with different names across distributions, you can specify uh, package names for Debian and package names for Fedora or package names for full bar that you need. So it, it is possible for to keep generic test definitions that you can reuse on every single image, that's, that's fine. Cool. All right. Thank you.